Hello and welcome to The Drum. I'm Steve Kinane. Coming up, Senator Bill Heffernan admits he is the devil. The National Party stakes their claim for a cut of the spoils of power. And the Fox News host who thinks Pre President Obama is a racist holds his own civil rights march on Washington. Our panel tonight, Tim Palmer from The 7.30 Report, author and social commentator Jane Currow, and the ABC religion and ethics editor online, Scott Stevens. Tony Abbott has been trying to portray the coalition as the stable alternative to form minority government, but he's not getting much help from the backbench. On the weekend, it was reported Albie Schultz had been ringing Tony Windsor and telling him it was time we all went back to the polls. Today, Rob Oakeshott revealed a Liberal MP had called his phone and, thinking he was talking to one of his kids, said to tell Dad it was the devil on the phone. Mr Oakeshott says he's concerned there are elements in the coalition who are trying to destabilise the negotiations and it's a test for Tony Abbott. And it is a confidence test of him whether he is going to be able to manage his troops for the next three years either as rogue elements or in a strategic sense if they're running a campaign to destabilise where we're at, to send everyone back to the polls, to spend $50 million of taxpayers' money. You know, that's the reflection I've got. Senator Bill Heffernan has since outed himself as the devil at the other end of the phone. Tim Palmer, are these kind of skirmishes likely to be doing harm to the, the Coalition's chances? I'm not sure that the Coalition is uh, putting in an enormous effort at the moment to look as if they're constructing something. At the same time, they're saying they're not trying to uh, destroy the prospects of a Coalition uh, and uh, to go back to an election. I must say that... As soon as I heard that uh, the devil had come calling yeah. uh, to Rob Oakeshott, you'd, for was some Bill reason, Heffernan Bill Heffernan list? was in my top five uh, <laughs> prospective Liberal MPs. I don't know why it occurred to me that way. But, so, I mean, it's not traditional negotiating, clearly, yep. but it's obviously what passes as a phone prank out at, in Juni. <laughs> um, but, uh, look, time is what the independents are calling for. I think they're still, believe it or not, some time ago, I always say to people that if you look at the last time Tony Windsor formed a, uh, a minority, helped support a minority government with the Griner government in 91, mm. it was the other three independents that formed a memorandum of understanding. All up, it took about three months to reach the, uh, the mm. point at which the government was uh, fully determined. This one's slightly more complicated. I mean, we even saw in the Nationals room today yep. uh, more complications with you know, exactly who's, who's sitting with who. That's so. right. Now, Jane, uh, we all thought that with Wilson Tucky losing the seat of O'Connor that the Liberal Party's mad uncle had been put out to pasture, uh -huh. but there seems there's still a few wacky relatives in the party room. I'd say so. Mind you, I think Bill Heffernan's got tickets on himself if he thinks he's the de devil. He's just <laughs> a silly old man who does bad jokes, it would seem to me. Um, the devil, one hopes, is a great deal sexier and more interesting than Bill Heffernan's ever managed to be. Uh, yeah, look, I don't know what the Liberals are playing at. Maybe it's a strategy, but, you know, I always think the same thing. If we've got a choice between a conspiracy and a stuff-up, it's a stuff-up every mm. time. Yep. So I'm going to say this is a stuff-up. They have some rogue elephants, as you say, or rogue uncles in the, mm. in the back benches and some closer to the front bench, uh, I think, on occasions. And, uh, yeah, they've been very disciplined throughout the campaign. And I think the lid's come off and the discipline's gone. Scott, what have you made of the negotiations so far? It just seems to me this is almost a classic proof of the correctness of Thomas Hobbes, one of the great fathers of modern politics. He said that as soon as a bastion, a single force of political power breaks down, what you actually have is war, you have anarchy. And it just seems to me that with every day as these negotiations drag on, what we're seeing isn't the dawning of some new era of you know, non-partisan politics. What we're actually seeing is almost total political anarchy. We're seeing uh, party platforms being replaced by these puerile uh, squabbles. And once again, as we saw before the election, we're actually seeing these local issues uh, taking uh, pride of place in, in national negotiations, which, uh, again, just seems to be entirely counterproductive. And you'd have to say that Labor seems the most eager to please, so much so that Wayne Swan wouldn't rule out on the weekend uh, setting up the tariff barriers again. Uh, which is... <laughs> Look, I, I, I found this quite extraordinary, that on the one hand, he, he would rule out the possibility of a Green ministry, of, uh, of, of a, Green, a member of the Green Party on the front bench, but he wouldn't ro rule out some sort of revision to tariff taxes. In other words, anything they could possibly do to try to keep you know, the mad catter on side, uh, it, which I, I just find, well, once again, quite extraordinary. And I, I do have to say, this is a bad look 
for Labour. I mean, before the election, uh, their approach to policy was at best promiscuous. They were more than happy to mix it and join it and sacrifice old agendas. And now after the election, again, uh, uh, for Gillard and for Swan, it's not a good look. Well, Tim, it's almost like saying we don't have standards, isn't it, by saying that we won't rule these kind of things out? I, I think the ruling of things out is the issue. I mean, the table must be groaning because nothing is being taken off the table. Yeah. <laughs> Warren Truss was at it uh, today, asked a number of times if uh, he'd direct more than $850 million towards regional Western Australia to satisfy the interests of one newly elected WA national who hasn't even said yet whether he'll sit on the, on the uh, benches of uh, any putative uh, coalition government. Mm. Uh, and again, wouldn't rule it out. Wouldn't rule out that amount. Wouldn't talk about it directly. Uh, just to, just um, uh, express some regret at the, the idea of it being difficult to spend $850 million because a big spending Labor government got in and, yeah. and put them oh. in a deficit first. But, uh, you know, so you've got a, 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 an opposition who went to the people, uh, stop the spending, stop the borrowing, cut the debt, uh, and yet, you know, here we are when it comes to the crunch of horse trading talking about a, a massive ticket item. Jane, Jane, what have you made the negotiations so far? Well, I think it, oh, I'm enjoying it hugely, actually. Nothing is giving me greater pleasure than seeing those two parties and those two leaders getting a good slapping from the electorate mm. and a good slapping from three independents. They richly deserve and it. And suddenly discover policy areas they never really cared about. Well, they, I don't think they care very much about <laughs> any of them. And I think the point is we have two party leaders who, who literally sold their souls to the devil, I don't know if it was Bill Heffernan or who it was, but they sold their souls to them, um, to get to win um, swinging seats that were completely focus group led in everything that they did pretty much. Tony Abbott a little more respectable than Julia Gillard but nevertheless. And now they're facing three people who actually have some beliefs. And in mm. fact not just three. And they have five or six beliefs too, don't they? They have diverse. I mean, you've got a Green with very strong beliefs. You've got Andrew Wilkie with his lots of points and all his beliefs. You've got the West Australian National, who I can't quite work out what he's on about, but he clearly believes very strongly in something. I think it's West Australia. Um, and then you've got three independents with really strong views about all sorts of issues. And it's really nice to see Tony Abbott and Julia Gillard being brought short by people who actually have something they care about. Scott, you've got a very uh, radical idea that's going to be published, I think, tomorrow mm. on the drum, that perhaps Tony Abbott could form an alliance with the Greens. Look, I, I think he's missing a crucial opportunity here. I, I'd actually take exception a little bit, Jane. I, I don't think we have have all these independents with very strong views. I actually think, if, if I can use a slightly different image, we have all these Lilliputian politicians scurrying, trying to get pride of place in the limelight. The latest, of course, being Steve Fielding, who hurled himself into the national debate with all the Lilliputian grace, is a good name for with him. all the grace and dignity of a piece of falling plaster. It was actually quite quite ridiculous. But I actually think that Tony Abbott is missing a real opportunity here. Instead of continuing the horse trading and the dealing and trying to cobble together some kind of bizarre policy amalgam as he did in the lead-up to the election. I think selling soul to the devil is exactly right. What he ought to be doing is reaching back within, into the conservative tradition itself. There's this old alliance, if you like, between conservationism and conservatism against the idea that all quote-unquote progress isn't necessarily good progress, that you can't necessarily have human uh, um, enlargement without a, a simultaneous enlargement in liberties and in virtues. And I think that if there was one way to shatter uh, and to, to remake the Australian political landscape, it would be for the possibility of a kind of green conservatism. Was that a time, though, when conservatism wasn't linked to business? Because what we're seeing now is, you know... The, the, the Liberal Party saying Greens are anti-business. If, if you put carbon tax on, you know, that's going to affect business. It's going to pick the, affect uh, coal exports and the like. So is that from a time that it's not really relevant anymore? It is, but we have, we have two problems here. The first is that the Greens themselves aren't simply an environmental group, but they're actually a hodgepodge, an amalgam of vague social progressivism. And at the same time, conservatism in Australia, I, if I can just say this, it's a desiccated variety. It's conservatism at the lowest end of the gene pool. And I think uh, the way that, that conservatism in Australia has taken shape isn't necessarily the way that it ought to. And above all, this kind of weddedness to big business uh, is, uh, is, is both a bad look and it's a kind of betrayal of the conservative legacy, which I think Malcolm Turnbull began to indicate on Q&A uh, last week when he himself was calling for campaign finance reform.
But it's interesting, isn't it? Because I'm never quite sure that conservative and progressive, left and right, actually make much sense anymore. Um, they're kind of old 19th century, 20th century, economically driven things. I keep seeing the world now much more along the lines of author authoritarian versus small L liberal. Mm. And most people seem to have a mixture of those. So, for example, the Liberal Party is small L liberal when it comes to economics. Mm. They, you know, laissez faire, let the winner keep it all, blah, blah, blah. Cap capitalism, etc., etc., but extremely authoritarian often when it comes to social issues. Mm. They really want to control what people do in their bedrooms, who's allowed to get married, you know, what you should do with your body, mm. reproductive rights, blah, blah, blah. On the other side, the so called progressives tend to be quite authoritarian when it comes to economics, you know, what you're allowed to do and what you're not allowed to do, and what business can do and what workers can do, etc., etc., but very liberal right. when it comes to social issues. So we have this kind of clash between two. two ideologies, both of which sides have taken bits of them mm. and neither holding to either particularly strongly. Right. It's really, we're, we're at a crux place where we haven't worked out yet what we believe for mm. the future, I think. Each what? of these individual politicians show a spectrum of that term. Mm. If you look at someone like Bob Catter, mm. he's very much a, a throwback to protectionism at one level. A libertarian at another yeah. level. Right. Gun control and, 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 and the gun control's gone 